I'm the Director of Educator Preparation at the Department of Higher Ed. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Roberto Montoya, the department's new Chief Equity Officer um, for leading and convening this, uh, this panel. Um, I will turn it over to you with gratitude. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lane. That means so much to me. Um, my name is uh, Roberto Montoya. I use he, him, LAO pronouns, and I am honored to serve as the first um, ever Chief Educational Equity Officer with the State of Colorado and the Department of Higher Education. Um, I've been doing this work for a long time, 20 plus years. I, I, I've worked in the private sector, um, the public sector, nonprofit, and higher education. And um, during my time at the University of Colorado Denver, I was so very fortunate uh, to have crossed paths with our two um, uh, folks that are going to be talking today. And I, I haven't the words to describe the impact that both both of these uh, folks have had on me um, in in so many different ways. Um, and I think it, this is really apropos, given what um, our convening this week has talked about in terms of the impact. Of, of educators, um, in particular, educators of color have had on us. I, um, I grew up in the barrios of Albuquerque, New Mexico, matriculated through the Albu Albuquerque public school system, and uh, yet did all my higher ed work here in the state of Colorado. I did uh, my undergraduate work at Mesa State, which is now called Colorado Mesa University, my graduate work at Regis University, and my PhD at, at UC Denver. And Dr. Manuel Espinosa, was the first educator that I've ever had that shared my gender, uh, race, and ethnicity. And I had him the second year um, of my doctoral um, experience. So you just think I went an entire academic career and never saw someone who looked like me in front of the class that wasn't a shop or a PE teacher. Um, and Dr. Espinosa is, is a, a child, as he says, of desegregation, Keys versus Denver School District number one in 1973 and is a, a Chicano ethnographer of education, working in the scholarly tradition that emerged during the 20th century struggle against racism in the US. Um, founded in, 2000, in 2007, he and the Right to Learn Dignity Lab have labored um, to develop a social interactional method for studying the manifestations of dignity in education. And in broad terms, um, R2L, is a research apprenticeship for undergraduate and graduate students in the social sciences, humanity, and in the law. Our other esteemed uh, uh, participant today and discussant today is uh, Maria Karina Sanchez, who I've had the distinct honor of being in classroom um, with, with her. Uh, and I told Dr. Espinosa this, uh, this past week when we were preparing is that, um, if I had a Rushmore of students, uh, Maria would be on that. Um, I learned so much from them and so much from, from you know, as Paulo Freire would say, how we, we challenge the banking system of education that, that we are both learner and educator at the same time. And um, having the gift of Maria in one of my classrooms was, um, was something that I'll cherish forever. And um, Maria grew up in, in Gypsum, a, a small town west of Vale and moved to uh, the city to attend CU Denver. Um, now in her fifth year as a seventh grade uh, language arts teacher, uh, she's a grad student at CU and has you know, really big dreams of expanding access to uh, bilingual education throughout the state. And her work in education um, uh, works symbiotically with, with her membership in the Right to Learn Dignity Lab. And so with that said, I wanna I want maybe frame um, a, a little bit about what, what R2L is, and maybe just ask, you know, uh, Dr. Espinosa, um, you know, what, what is the Right to Learn Dignity Lab and, and, and what are your roles? Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be with you, with, here with you, brother. Um, I'm the director of the Right to Learn uh, Dignity Lab. I'm its second founding member. Its first founding member is Tanya Soto Valenzuela, who's also in the Zoom room as well. Um, we are in our 15th year of existence. So the, the Dignity Lab is a teenager. It's, it's about to get its driver's permit <laughs> and it'll be going for its license next year. Um, <clears throat> we have six generations of undergraduates who have contributed to the research 
that we do in the in the dignity lab we study dignity from a social interactional perspective and now we are in this advocacy phase in which we are in which we have put forth uh, candidate a candidate amendment to the education clause of the Colorado Constitution. So I guess one could say that we're in the public advocacy phase of the research endeavor known as the, the Right to Learn Dignity Lab. Mm. And how about you, Maria? What, what's your role with, with R2O? Um, yeah, thank you as well for, for having us today. Um, I joined Right to Learn in 2014 when I was in my undergrad still at CU Denver. I remember the first meeting I went to, I was very overwhelmed and intimidated by the work that had already been done. But more than anything, I was really intrigued by, by the work and, and had so many questions and just wanted to know more about what they were doing. And so I just kept going back and kept going back. And it's been seven years now and I'm still still in the group. Um, and my, my role has really shifted depending on what work we've done. So sometimes it's you know, being here um, in, in talks like, like this one where we're sharing our work and talking about what we're doing. Sometimes it's been um, hours of research and reading and whatever whatever the group needs. Maria, really quick, I know this isn't on the question, this is me just asking you out of curiosity. What, what compelled you to even go to the meeting in the first place? Like what, what was the kind of the, the you know, the manifestation or maybe the seed that really kind of turned into you wanting to attend that um, to begin with? Um, I was actually in uh, Dr. Espinosa's EDFN 1000 class, um, Equality, Rights, and Education. That was, that was where we met. And he talked about this group called Right to Learn, and he didn't say much about it. He just said, you know, this, this is a group that, that I'm working with. You want to know more? come to a meeting um, and, and that was it just the name itself I was like oh the right to learn yeah that that mm -hmm. sounds like something I want to hear more about that's awesome and as someone who has been in Dr. Espinosa's class um, you know I can understand how just I mean his classrooms in and of itself really inspire you know a, a deep desire to of curiosity and of of rigor. And so I, I can imagine, you know, both of us as, as former students of Dr. Espinosa being very curious and intrigued to be like, well, I want to hear more about this. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, you, you both had mentioned, um, you know, the work of, of the Right to Learn Dignity Lab and, you know, that, that you're looking to amend the Colorado Constitution. Why is it so important to amend the Colorado Constitution by elevating education to the status of, of a fundamental right? Like, why is that so important? So I'll just kind of open that up. Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, it, amending the education clause in our state is long overdue. Uh, I'll paraphrase some of the language of Senator Frank Church during the 1950s when they had a civil rights bill um, in Congress. And he spoke these words on the floor of Congress, more or less. And then I'll, and then I'll say something additional to that. Um, you know, when you're building an amendment that 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 entails elevating education to the status of fundamental right, you know, that's careful, thoughtful work. Um, you know, it, it bears the same relation. Building an amendment bear, like this bear, bears the same relation to legislation as building a cathedral does to a factory, right? Workaday structures are made with ordinary materials, but we build churches, synagogues, mosques, with the finest materials and we build them with great care because we're trying to make them for the ages, right? So that, that, all of that is, you know, that's key to understanding what it is that we're trying to do here. But there's something else as well. Everyone in here knows that the finest cathedral, if, if the dignity of the human people within is not recognized and respected, well, be, it can become the most impoverished hovel, right? It may look really nice, but it will just be facade. So our amendment is about figuring out what it is that happens inside school, right? And elevating the status of treatment of all human beings within the school. We've had this education clause since 1876. We've learned, we've had revolutions in educational thought since then. Right? I can give you three names, right? Piaget, John Dewey, Lev Vygotsky. 
those are three revolutions, right, that have happened in educational research. And they haven't really fed into the constitutional mandate that we have. One of the more important things about elevating education to the status of fundamental right is that, changes, is that it changes our duties and obligations. Every right is incitant upon another person, right? For me to be able to say I have the right to vote or I have the right to, uh, to freedom of assembly depends on other people and the way they act toward that right, especially my government, whether they protect, respect, and support the right. So, you know, it, it's time, in a sense, we're just trying to modernize the Colorado Constitution through the language of human rights. Maria, anything that you, you want to maybe add to that as well? Yeah, and I apologize for the disruption. I'm borrowing a co-worker's office and she told me they just installed um what is it the lights that oh, the motion motion lights off, yeah. this morning yeah they turned off and she doesn't know where the switch is so I apologize I might have to step away every few minutes to just to trigger the sensors um but for for your question we've we've talked about this in our in our group there's this assumption with with education, right? The, the more we get to have these conversations with people, the more we get this question of, isn't education already a fundamental right? And, and when we say no, most people are, are shocked or you know, they, they take a, a minute to sort of sit with that information. Um, and so for, for us too, we've talked about how this, this is a sort of like a halfway point in our work too. So um, amending the constitution wouldn't be, all right, that's it. Good job, right to learn. Moving on. Um, you know, the, the work would would barely be starting in a sense, and then we would continue to to move on and um, and work on implementing right that that language and, and finding ways of continuing to spread the message of educational dignity as well. All right. Thank you both for for sharing that and, and talking about why why it's so important for us to do this. Really quick, are, are there any other states that have this type of of language within their state constitutions certainly <clears throat> certainly there are very few states in in our union that have elevated education to the status of a, a fun, of a fundamental right i'll give you one of the oldest ones massachusetts we have massachusetts has some of the oldest education laws in our country right and if you get a chance if anyone gets a chance yeah, i suggest that you know you look uh, at the Massachusetts Constitution, and it's, um, I believe it's, it's called Part the Second. This is old, old English, right? Where you'll find the education clause. And, and within there, there's language that is, that is just ringing, that's poetic, and that is also useful in its guidance that it provides. One of the duties of the state is to cherish the interests of science and literature. I mean, that's, that's not hortatory, right? That's not just, let's try our best. That's, that's a legal obligation, right? That's, that seeks to extract something different from us. At the international level, Finland. Finland has, you know, a, a, a quite a beautiful approach to, you know, to understanding education through its basic education laws, right? But one of the things that I think is really worth noting in Finland is that they have this wonderful attitude toward lifelong learning. They understand first of all, that labor markets change and that sometimes that the skills that you train for at the age of 20, right, may not be the things that you need at the age of 40 and that there's access to quality education for people to return later in life in order to satisfy those labor needs and also to make a living and to find something fulfilling. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, you know, this is fascinating just thinking about, you know, how, how this work ties into um, the way that we see education writ large, um, especially in these times that um, that we are in with with such um, I would say resistance to the value of education. Um, sometimes we see this in our own communities of you know really helping. Um, you know, black, brown, indigenous students understand the value and the role of education, and, and, and in, in our case, higher education. Um, and so looking to these other states that really have historically, um, you know, valued education in this way is, is really important. Um, I think for me, I know, I know in hearing you all talk about this, and you know, we've had these conversations a lot, is um, 
you know, would you all be willing to share what it is, what is the language that you're trying to, to put into the Colorado um, Constitution? And, and, and if you'd be so, uh, we'd be so honored if you'd read it uh, for us. Oh. Would you believe? Most definitely. If I may, may I ask that Maria do the honors, please. Sure. Yes. Let me um, let me try. I have the language here. Thank you for sharing it. Let me bring it up really quick. There. Can you all see that now? Can you see that? If someone can give me a thumbs up, I can't really see people. Or just let me know that you could see that. No. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Education is a fundamental right held by all human persons. It is a means for achieving social equality and necessary for the fulfillment of freedom, justice, and peace. The Colorado General Assembly shall protect, respect, and support this right. Public schools are sanctuaries, spaces where the inherent and inalienable dignity of the human person is inviolate, spaces where compassionate guidance abounds. In its effect, Education for human growth and dignity strengthens the individual and community. It fosters agency rather than servitude and fosters solidarity among all people. Furthermore, education enables the actualization of human potential through the arts, sciences, and humanities. The Colorado General Assembly shall create and maintain public schools as safe and healthy spaces where all human persons will experience their inherent dignity and understand the rights flowing from it. Guided by the principles of integrity and equity, the Colorado General Assembly shall ensure that all public school students have ongoing and diverse opportunities to meaningfully participate in their education. As a paramount requisite of education, meaningful participation fulfills the promise of the public schools as havens for learning and growth, crucibles for inquiry and experimentation, forums for dialogue and dissent. <laughs> Maria, thank you so much for reading that. Um, that's beautiful. How was it created? Like, who, who, wh where did this come from? Like, like this is, um, and again, like, I'll, I'll bring it back up here in a second, but I'm just really curious how, how this language and, and, and these beautiful words came to be. I can say some of that, and then Maria can also say a bit too. It, there's one way you can say that this this amendment has been 15 years in the writing. Um, you know, I, when the group first started, we knew we, we wanted to deal with foundational issues in education, but we did not yet know that it would be the amendment the to amending the education clause. We didn't even have a name for the group the first few years, right? So I can say that let's say about four years ago one of the research associates, one of our senior research associates, Frida Silva, um, asked me in a meeting, Profe, where is all this going? And I think we knew, right? We were adding up, we were doing all the adding and, and all the subtracting of things. And we knew where this was headed. We knew that, that we were working towards some kind of fundamental remedy for the generational inequality in educational attainment in our state. Um, and if I can say also like in a more focused manner, you know, this is about a, a little bit more than 190 words. And that's the culmination of really 15 years of thinking and writing. But really the focus of it is, let's say it took us about a year meeting weekly, hammering out sentences, concepts, ideas. And then I think Maria can say a little bit from there as well. Yeah, I think once the group decided that this was the direction we were heading, we knew it, it needed to be a collective effort and that everyone in, in some way or another would be participating in the writing. And so it was a lot of meetings at first just to talk about, okay, what are, what are those pieces that have to be a part of the language? What are those, those concepts that we want to make sure we include? Um, and after weeks of just kind of talking through things, we started drafting. Once we had a draft, that draft went through months of scrutiny. Um, and, and so as a group, we decided to write these micro essays. Um, and and that, was, that also came from uh, Frida who had written micro essays for, for one of her classes. 
And she told us about this idea where in a, in a micro essay, you take these large concepts, large ideas, and instead of writing pages and pages to, to dissect those ideas, you're, you're given one page and that's, that's all you get. And you have to be as concise and precise as possible. And we thought that was perfect for, for our next step. If we wanted to, to really hone in on what it was that the amendment needed to say, then we needed to be very, very concise and very specific. So as, as a group, we each signed up for at least one sentence that we were going to review. Um, and with your partner or with your group, you had to write a micro essay, starting with one sentence from our draft. And then you had to write one page explaining whether you were making any changes, whether the sentence stood as it was. And at the end, you had to rewrite your sentence. Or if you made no changes, you had to you know, explain that throughout the micro essay. And so each of us did this with at least one sentence. Um, and and it, it was a process. It, it took us a while. And, and at the end, we, we ended with some sentences that, that stood the test and they, they remained and some that completely changed. But it was a, a really cool process for us to, to really think slowly and thoughtfully. And, and that's um, a really, I think, key piece of how we arrived at this language too. Think, of, think about like the Federalist Papers, but for right to learn. <laughs> think about it like that. So, and, and believe me, they were valuable when we appeared before the Legislative Council last week. We, we showed up supremely prepared for that, for that legislative step. Yeah, so th that leads to the next question of, um, not, not, and, and thank you for sharing the process and, and for these words, because I think even in receiving it and looking at it, there is a, um, a clarity that there has been such intentionality, care, and, um, you know, just preciseness in, in the language that is used that, that really, um, it's hard to not see, it's hard to not even experience just you can tell how much work has been put into into these beautiful words so i just want to commend you all for, for that 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 beautiful language um as someone who is a uh, you know a wielder of words i'm you know it's it's inspiring to see that um you mentioned the federalist papers and you know you you wonder who 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 is who is the hamilton and the uh uh, <laughs> uh maria has hamilton <laughs> and she wrote most of it, but but you actually in in what you just said, Doctor Espinosa, you you just mentioned you know how it was received. You know before we get to 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 the legislature and and what you all did, how has this been received by other folks that you've shared it with uh, so far? Like what has been some of the comments? What's been some of the the feedback that you all have received? Sure, sure. You, you know at the legislative council hearing, um, we we had some some new allies there with us. And it's the Student Bill of Rights Working Group from Denver Public Schools. So they're working on this, this wonderful idea called the Student Bill of Rights, and they want it to have some teeth. So they know that if we're able to accomplish what we can with the amendment, that their Student Bill of Rights will have, you know, will be able to gain some traction, let's say. You should see how they talk about it. You know, I'm talking uh, the, emotion, the, the emotional reaction, I think, is really telling and it really it's really validating, I think, from from our perspective as well. Um, you know, to to see them visibly moved, I think, and for them to describe the the ideas and the, and the language as beautiful and helpful, I think is is something really a, a landmark achievement for us. It's, it it lets us know that we're on the right track. Absolutely. Um, thank you for yeah, because um, it 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 is. It's such. A beautiful way of articulating um, what should be. You said, you know, like a lot of. I think Maria said that people are isn't it already a fundamental right. People asking that, but you know, it it it, it that is something that cannot be assumed. I want to pivot a little bit um, because within looking at the clause or looking at, at the amendment, excuse me, um, and I'm going to bring it back up uh, for for our participants. Within the actual text itself, um, there are two in, there, you know there are two instances where um, inherent indignity are are you know talked about. You know you talk about the inherent and inalienable dignity of the human person, and then lower in the second um, part of of the text, 
again, it says, well, you know, human persons will experience the inherent dignity um, and understanding um, the rights flowing from it. So with educators, students, families, and maybe even society writ large in mind, how, what, is, what do you mean when you're talking about educational dignity? What, what do you mean when you're saying that? Sure, sure. Um, maybe I can set the table for Maria as well. Um, uh, you know, dignity is the inherent value, the supreme value of the human being. We all have it by simple virtue of being human, right? No one has to agree where it comes from. You only have to agree that human beings have it, right? And from that flow rights. And it's important that dignity be thought of, it's important that dignity is inherent. If it rises and falls, like a quantity that you have, if it rises and falls, like the price of gasoline, so does the structure of rights on the planet, right? Human rights mean absolutely, human rights are a little bit less weighty, a lot less weighty than they are. Civil rights, political rights, if they can come and go just like that based on, on whim, you know, then, then dignity doesn't mean much, right? But there are certain, there's a distinction that's made in the human rights instruments around the world. This quality may be inherent, meaning you, you, don't, you can't lose it. No one can take it. You may live in a society that doesn't recognize your dignity, but that's something different, right? The quality is inherent, but the experience and sense of dignity, those are contingent. Those don't have to happen, right? Whether it be in healthcare, interpersonal relationships, in, in childhood, right? Wherever it may be, where, any place in social life. So in education, if I can just say in the most general sense, education is, educational dignity is, is the sense, a person's sense of value, right? That derives from intra and interpersonal learning experiences that recognize and affirm a person's mind, humanity, and potential, right? That's the most general, broad kind of abstract definition. And maybe Maria can say something from here to, so you, to sort of give you a sense of, you know, from a teacher's perspective, right? how it is that that sort of materializes for her. I, I think for me, it's the promise that one's dignity will be upheld in all educational settings. Um, and, and I, in my fifth year, I, I don't think that's, that's where we're at right now, right? That's where, where so much of my, my interest and, and passion in continuing to work with with right to learn comes from is is the the things that I see in in my own classroom and other classrooms, um, and I, I think educational dignity really allows for students to be seen fully, right? We we see the we hear this um, this phrase in education all the time about the whole child, but the times that you actually see somebody recognizing the whole child, I, I think are are not as as frequent as we would like them to be. Um, I mean, even just thinking about my my own personal experience, it's it's even the the little moments where uh, where you're given that choice or where where somebody just recognizes your your humanity. I, I had a middle school teacher um, that I, I still remember. We were uh, we were doing a fantasy unit, and so our our teacher gave us fantasy books we were going to read, and she gave me Aragon. And I, I read a little bit, and at, by this point, I, I read all the time. I loved reading, um, but I, after a day, I told her, I said, Miss Carrion, I can't read this book. It's, I just, I don't like it. And uh, she goes, well, what, what don't you like about it? And I said, I don't like fantasy. I don't know. I just, I don't like fantasy. I don't, I don't want to read about dragons. And, and she, um, she thought for a minute, and she goes, hey, you're going to read The Princess Bride. And I was like, is it fantasy? And she's like, yes, but it's different. You're, and just try it. I think you'll like it. Um, but I, I still remember that moment because it, it was such a small thing, but she, she gave me that choice and she, she didn't just say like, no, I'm the teacher. You're going to do this. You know, we, we had that, that conversation and, and she made me feel like I was actually being recognized um, as, a, as a person. Um, and I and I did end up loving the Princess Bride. She was right; it was a great book. Um, but I I think educa educational dignity really creates opportunities for students. Right? It um, it allows them to participate, explore, create to their fullest extent. It's and it's the the dream for a classroom. 
Yeah, thank like, you so, for, so much for sharing that. I'm sorry, Dr. Sinasa, please go ahead. Real quick, because Maria's example was so vivid. One thing to remember is like, you know, educational rights at the international level, those equate to participation rights. So Maria being able to choose and being able to say, right, that this, but this book doesn't, doesn't vibe for me and to have her voice listened to, right? That doesn't mean each and every time that you win the argument or whatever it may be, right? But that, that means that someone is listening to you. Mm. That's what participation rights equate to in educational settings. That's so great. Yeah, thank you. And, and Maria, yeah, I was, thank you for that, Dr. Espinosa and Maria, for you sharing, um, you know, and, and Dr. Espinosa, you said that part of it is affirming the mind. And sometimes, like you said, there is a participatory aspect of that, of affirming one's ability to, to navigate that. And, you know, as a Montoya, the Princess Bride has played a big role in my life in legitimizing Montoyas. Every time I know when I say my name is Roberto Montoya, I know what people think. Thank you to, to the Princess Bride. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I am, that, that's such a, a beautiful way, all joking aside, of, of sharing what, what dignity. Um, can look like and, and, and within, um, you know, for teachers and families and, and, and what that means. And, you know, what, what Maria was sharing about her, that interaction with her particular teacher and then talking about, Maria, you talking about your own role now, which you're in such a, an interesting, you know, position to be participating and thinking about this from as a student, as an educator, and then as a creator, and, and, and leader in kind of moving this work forward. Um, the question I had though, what, when we were talking about this and, and really how this particular conversation manifested was, you know, as you mentioned, affirming the mind, you said value and potential, is that correct? Did I, did I get that? Like, and- Mind, humanity, and potential. Mind, humanity, and potential. Mm -hmm. And being seen, fully as maria said and um so can it be so can, the question I, I guess i have is can students have educational dig dignity if they don't see educators who look like them like it, what role does that play in being seen fully you know given the current teacher dem demographics are so homogenous that they're so overwhelmingly white and female um would educational dignity be mo more potent if our teaching force mirrored the student population? You ask, you ask very intriguing questions, Roberto. And I think every person, every per, what's really beautiful, I think about this amendment and about human rights in general, right? Is that every person has the instrument to interpret and understand a human rights amendment, a fundamental uh, education as a fundamental right. Every one of us in this Zoom room can talk about ways in which our dignity has been affirmed and upheld in educational environments. Every one of us can talk about the, way, the ways our dignity has been frustrated and insulted in educational environments. And then the question to ask is, do you think that there is sort of a racial ethnic dimension to that, right? And that gives you sort of the, the primary sort of, you know, kind of, uh, in, you know, the primary tools to be able to talk about intelligently about a question like that. This is a question about parity, I think, right? This is a question about parity and whether it matters that the person up there shares some sort of really common fundamental characteristic as you. You know, you know my sense is certainly it has a, a shaping influence. It, it certainly wouldn't be the independent factor, right? You know, I'd rather have a teacher that was of a, that was a different sort of racial ethnic, you know, uh, of a different racial ethnic group if they were compassionate. I would rather have them than the person who does match me and, and doesn't have patience or time for me, you know? So it's a whole conglomerate of things, right? I understand it. I understand the theory. And, and it's, it's for me, is a really enticing line of research. I can easily imagine somebody asking that question with the force of this amendment behind them to be heard. Yes. How about you, Maria? How, how, how would you answer that question? Yeah. I it's interesting because there, there's, I think so many factors that that have created, right? Or maybe like attributed, attributed to the, the current teacher demographics and, and what that looks like around our country. Um, I, I had a similar experience um, 
two years, Dr. Montoya, where I, I didn't have an educator who shared my background until I took Dr. Espinosa's class. Um, and I, I remember I was, I was really excited um, that first day when, um, when I thought just of the, the possibility that, that someone who, who shared a similar background um, to mine could, could be a professor. Like that was not something I had really ever envisioned before. Um, and so it was, it was that, that moment of like, oh, wow, like I, I could do this, you know? Um, and I, I think where, where our amendment kind of ties back into is the, the hope for me is that the amendment opens more of those doors, right? And creates more opportunities. Um, when, when I told my, my family uh, that I wanted to be a teacher, I think it was after my first year in an undergrad. I, I went in undeclared. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And when I took equality rights and, and education with Dr. Espinosa, I was like, I, I think I want to be a teacher. I think that's the path I, I want to pursue. And when I told my dad specifically, he just, he got really quiet and he was like, I don't think he meant it in a rude way, but, but the way it came out, you know, he said, uh, we're going to spend a lot of money and, and effort for you to uh, go through college. And, and, you know, teachers don't, don't make a lot of money, you know? And, and so to him, I think, um, because of our, our family's history and our background, college was, was like an investment, right? Like you're going to put in and then hopefully you get out more than that. Um, and so to him teaching maybe wasn't necessarily the, the next step. Um, but we, you know, we talked about it. We talked about why that was what I chose to do. And, and he was supportive after that as well. But, um, I mean, I've, I've also had, you know, many students who on the, the first day they, they hear my, uh, my last name and they, they hear that my family's from Mexico and they're like, oh, like you, you speak Spanish and, you know, they, they get very excited. Um, and so I, I think it's all of these, these factors that are, that are connected and it's, I, I wouldn't say it, uh, it doesn't matter, right? That, that my background is, is similar to my students. I, I do think it's a, a big factor. Um, and, and like I said, hopefully the amendment is that, that connection piece to that, that opens more, more doors. Thank you, Maria. I got a little quick addendum. Remember like, you know, I'm, I'm an anthropologist. So I'll give you an anthropologist of education answer. It, it matters because when you see someone up there that has an affinity toward how you are, how you look, your eye color, right? Your lips, your cheekbones, all of that, right? Talks like you, comes from a similar kind of background, right? It makes certain possibilities real in the world. Think about the value of the human to that, right? That a possibility is not a fantasy, it's something almost tangible that you can feel, that it makes it like, yes, perhaps I. Indeed, and I think that, you know, thank you both for sharing that, you know, because I think, you know, as those of us in, in this convening itself is talking about how we begin, you know, across the whole spectrum of looking at diversifying, um, not only the professoriate, but, you know, um, PK through 12 teachers and, you know, anchoring it to this, the, the work that you all are doing, um, it is important. Um, and it is not the only factor, right? I mean, it's, it's, we know that you could have a teacher, a professor of color that doesn't necessarily mean that your experience is going to be great. But Maria, what you shared about, you know, seeing professors that have, you know, that, that share your background. I think as a professor who taught in teacher ed for a very long time, on my end as well, I would look at the roster that I would get and see, you know, are there any, and this is, this, this is fraught because you don't, like names are, you know, in, in even phenotypes, you don't know, but seeing students of color come through the program, there was a certain, um, you know, kind of elevated sense of responsibility of what it means within a teacher preparation program um, to have these students coming because we knew that there were so few of them. And so what it, it, even, you know, I think the work that you all are doing in terms of lifting up dignity as inherent, I think I didn't have the language to understand, but I felt that sense of how do I make sure that this experience is dignified for all the students, especially those who are going to be um, 
really isolated in certain ways within their cohorts, within their classrooms, and even sometimes within the curriculum and material and, and the ways in which that we teach how to teach. Uh, so these are all things that are operating, I think, simultaneously at the same time. And so, you know, with the work that you all are doing, what impact, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about this, but what impact do you think that this, that this amendment will have on, on higher education? You know, we talked a little bit about teacher education, but maybe, you know, just higher education, like, you know, kind of largely or broadly. What do you think, what kind of work do you think this, this, this amendment could have, an impact it could have? Sure, sure. You know, I'm, I'm a teacher educator, so I'll, I'll, I feel it better for me to, to um, you know, respond to that, that, that wonderful question from, from my, van, my professional vantage point. This is an amendment that is not, it, its its intent is not to um, give the public a bigger stick with which to hit teachers. It's not that. We are trying to create, make a shift here in Colorado public education toward the creation of human rights cultures within the schools, right? That's a generation long kind of endeavor, right? So I see from, from my point of view in higher education that, that, that everyone will have to undergo, undergo a different kind of apprenticeship. Teachers in schools, students in schools, families, administrators, and also those of us in teacher education as well. We'll have to learn how to help people learn how to become designers of educational environments for dignity bearing and rights holding people. Right? That's different than what it is that we see in schools today. It is different. The inequality shows us that, right? The generational inequality, those numbers tell us that. So I think we're going to have to really learn as a profession how to provide robust, interesting, exciting. Think about this, robust, interesting, exciting professional development. <laughs> you know? Are you saying that PD is not that currently? Hey man, I've sat through some of those, you know. <laughs> I can't speak for everyone, you know, but I think um, that that's that's where I think so much uh, so many of the resources will will go in helping teachers learn how to do this, not simply punish them or or hit them for quote unquote not complying with the law. This is not an amendment that seeks to make more rigid the line of compliance. We seek to exact the moral, creative, and pedagogical maximum from people because we're we're fulfilling. And being a teacher, you know, you are fulfilling and giving shape to the finest impulses of your humanity because you're, you're in a profession that helps people learn how to grow. How much more human do you get than that? Mm. How about you, Maria? What, what impact do you think this will have on, on higher ed? I think pretty similarly, we'll see a, hopefully we would see a, a change in and what those education courses look like, what that preparation looks like. Um, and, I, and I think it, it really, it spans through K through 12 education and right and just into, into everything else. Um, one thing we, we talked about when we were drafting this, this amendment too was that this was written with students at the forefront, right, and students in mind. Um, but we really were thinking about everyone in the building, right, everyone within the walls of, of what we call schools. And, and the, the goal for the amendment is that it, it touches everywhere, right? And so it's, it's not, um, you know, it's uh, like, like Dr. Espinoza said, it's, it's not for, for punishment, it's really to, to uplift dignity. Thank you. Yeah. You know, when you, uh, our, our public school education system has the potential to become one of the crown jewels of our state. Very much like the natural wonders that we have, right? The Garden of the Gods, the sand dunes, you know? And you go to the sand dunes in Southern Colorado and it kind of appears out of nowhere and you wonder how did that happen? Then you get the signs and, and their best guess is around 10,000 years, right? To make the sand dunes. It won't take us that long to create a public education system that pays deference to the dignity of the human person. I think we can begin to see the positive effects of that within a generation. It will require a shift and a turn and, some, and, and a lot of learning, 
but we're not going to have to wait 10,000 years. This is within grasp. Mm. So along those, thank you for that. Along those lines, you mentioned earlier that you were doing some work in, in partnership with some of the young, amazing young folks at DPS. Mm -hmm. And this is not, and I'm, I'm remixing right now. So this is, this is my love of hip hop. I'm just, I'm going to throw a remix in here. This question is not on what we prepared, <laughs> but something that just came to me. How, how, in working with those young folks, and then as Maria said that this was really centering in, in, in student created and, and, you know, thinking of students with students in mind, how do we translate this to, to young folks to understand when this is added, I'm going to speak this into existence, when this is added to our constitution, how, how do we get young folks to understand this and how do we, how do we kind of, you know, animate it for them and bring it to life for them? Sure, sure. At least I know this and, and, and someone who works with, with younger children at the elementary level would have to answer this. And Maria can say something about middle school students. But, you know, when I, my, my work has largely been with high school students and undergraduates. And it doesn't take much. They hear it and they feel it, right? They feel it. You, you know, young people in our schools, that, that, that's the alpha and the omega of any equity measurement. Because if the young person says there's a problem, right? And then after the remedy is quote unquote applied, if they still say there's a problem, then I think the remedy is suspect, is it not? You know? So it's the young person, I think, that really will, will help drive this, you know? And, and I think for me, if, if, the indica if the reaction from the Student Bill of Rights Working Group, uh, young people is any indication, I think they're going to rejoice at this. It's a language that they really get because they have a different thirst for justice, I think, than, our, than, my, than my generation had. I really, I really have a great admiration you know, for what it is that the, the present generation, how they think, how they feel, and how they give voice to that. Maria was too sedentary, the, 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 the motion detector. <laughs> She's moving to get the light back on. That's She's moving okay. to get the light back on. I, I am curious. I would love to hear from, from Maria how, how, you know, even with middle schoolers, right? Like, you know, when you all um, see this through, um, how, how you unpack and, and gift this to, to your young students, Maria. You got the light Sorry. back. The <laughs> sensor is in the classroom, not in the office. So it makes it a little harder. <laughs> no problem. But I can repeat the question. I'm just curious, you know, you know, as someone who who's played such an instrumental role in crafting, creating, and when this is this ultimately added to the constitution, how are you going to unpack and gift this to your students? Like, you know, like how do we make sure that they know that this, what this is, what this means, and 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 how it is theirs? I really like what Dr. Espinosa said about students really like understanding what's what's happening in their in their own education. Um, and I, I think, you know, some of the the language might might shift, right? Some of the words we use might be a little different. Um, you know, the the younger you the the younger the students are. Um, but actually today, uh, my first two classes were were asking me um they they noticed I, I actually did something different with my hair so they're like miss why why did you curl your hair and, you know and I shared with them that that I was presenting today and they wanted to know more about it and and I told them that our that our group is is um hoping to amend the constitution to have education be a fundamental right and and I got some very middle school responses you know the the first hand that went up um, the student goes, Miss. So you're saying I don't have to be here, right? I can go home. <laughs> and um, and I just I was like, No, that's that's not exactly what I'm saying. Um, but but we talked a little bit about you know like what that means for something to to be a right and and even if they don't have a full grasp of that language, they they understand so much, right? They even if they can't tell you in the same language that right to learn uses sometimes is like, you know, there was, there was something that infringed on my dignity. They'll, they'll come to you and, and they'll know that something is off, right? They'll, they'll say, you know, this happened and, and, and I'm frustrated or I don't feel good about it. Um, and so I, I think a lot of it is, is really just having conversations with students around what it is that they want their education to look like, you know, what, what does it look like for you to have a class where, where you feel valued and you feel seen and, um, and 
and then maybe it's because I work with middle schoolers, but they're they're very vocal about it. They will they will definitely let you know when something is off. For sure, and thank you for, for that's that's very funny that you know having uh, <laughs> raised a middle schooler that's that's it's really funny. But I think what's also really beautiful about this, and and Maria, you and I have had many conversations about this, is that this language is is so asset you know, focused, right? And in, in a, you know, young folks and many folks, even though they might have the language, they know what it feels like to have, to, to experience indignity and to in, in experience injustice. And though, because of that, you have a, a certain perspective and, and an epistemology, a way of knowing of what that is. And then this language helps you think of what it could be, what it should be, what it needs to be. And so I just love how you all are doing that. in such a, um, you know, like you said, clear, concise, and elegant way um, that is just really beautiful. So what's what are the next steps for you all with, with this work? Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. So we just finished te you know, te testifying or appearing in a hearing before the Legislative Council, and that's part of public record now. Um, so our next step is they, they gave us the blessing in a way to go on to the title board. And the title board makes us into a campaign. So what they do is they essentially typeset the language, chisel it in stone, and that's what you fight on, right? That's what you campaign on. Um, and then after that, after you're formally a campaign, you can take donations. And more importantly, you can now collect signatures. So for us to get it on the ballot for November of 2022, we have six months to collect roughly 125,000 signatures in each of the county seats. Like there's a there's a percentage, right, that, uh, that you have to do in each of the county seats. It's been made more difficult to amend the Colorado Constitution in, in the last few years. Um, we, we chose that. We, we could have went the other route to have the bill sponsored, have a bill and have it sponsored by a, a representative. This seems better to us. What good does it do to have a fundamental right to education if the people of Colorado don't express the political will to give it wings, right? If we don't show the expertise and, and the, if we don't exercise the choice to actually do something with it, it's important for us that it be the, the choice of the people. That's, that's the only way the law can come to be written in the minds and the hearts of, of every resident here. So after that, just look out for our social media campaign, which is about to launch soon. And, and you'll have all the information there, updates on the language, everything. What, what you saw just a few minutes ago is essentially the final language. There may be one or two slight changes made there. So when we become official, you'll be the first one we let know. Well, awesome. Thank you for that. And um, let me ask a quick question before I wanna ask, before we, I wanna ask one last question then open it up to any questions that we have from, from those who are, who are here. Um, What, what, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, reading this and hearing you all talk about it, what does resistance look like to this? Like what, you know, like, and, and I asked like, how have people received it? Have you, and, and if you've received resistance or anyone that has really had questions, how did it manifest and what were they necessarily kind of objecting to perhaps? Yes. I'll give you a social science answer. Nothing that that for me yet constitutes a pattern of resistance, right? Okay. But but here's one. Here are some of the more frequent questions. People think that this has to do with funding. It does not, right? It does not. In in Colorado, if you're going to amend the constitution, you are you are bound by constitutional rule to limit it to a single subject, and our single subject is making education into a fundamental right. At present. It's a governmental service in some broad sense. It's more than light. It's more than driver's licenses, but it falls way short of like of the fundamental right to vote, right? So what we're trying to do is elevate it to that status. The question of funding belongs to the people of Colorado via their duly elected representatives, the legislature. So I think maybe perhaps more than resistance, it's um, education in some ways, right? Kind of like when we're out there. Collecting signatures, it'll it'll have to be at, on certain occasions, I imagine. Civics 101. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, maybe lastly, how how can this community and maybe you know support you and, and get involved in, in the work? You mentioned signatures, you mentioned some other stuff. Like, how can we support this work? I think Maria has a response. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think because of the the route we chose, you know, we did as a group decided that that we would 
be out around the state collecting signatures. I think one of our biggest asks is that people spread the word, you know, and that that you you mention our group and that um, and that you get people talking about it. We we know that it's it's going to take a lot more than than our small group to to be out and to be talking to people a, about this amendment. Um, and so a, a big a big piece would be you know share it with with everyone your family your friends your colleagues and and if anybody wants to know more get them in touch with us we would love to talk to people about it as much as we can awesome maria always makes me like her comments spark something in mind a little addendum you know the, the lawrence tribe who was former president obama's professor at harvard law wrote a, wrote an article a few years ago, a few years ago called america's constitutional narrative and in this, he talks about how, of course, the Supreme Court shapes the narrative, so do legislatures, but so do everyday people in the course of their everyday lives through social movements and, in, and also just in the conversations within the ambit of their everyday lives. Think about this thing called America's constitutional narrative and how long it has taken us 15 years to get a turn at talk. So please talk with us, talk with us, right? Communicate with us. If there's any questions as to what this may mean, we are more than happy to engage with anyone. If you have a forum of two people or more, we'll go speak. It could be it could be your Sunday brunch. We don't even have to eat, man. You know, we just want five minutes. We'll do that. And um, thank you. Let me just say this. Thank you both so much for taking you know the time to be here with us to share um, this this beautiful work, um, this culmination, as you said of of, of of you know, 15 years of work with us and your commitment to dignity and to education. Um, I just wanted to, to give you all my deepest thanks. And with that, um, would love to open it up to any questions if you wanna put them in the chat or, or feel free to come off a of mute and ask any questions that you have for Dr. Espinosa and for Maria uh, regarding this really, um, this really important and vital work. All praise to the young people of Right to Learn. Roberto, you know, yeah. they helped make me into the person that I am. And Maria is too modest to say it, but she's not just a member of Right to Learn. She's one of my senior research associates. She earned that. Yeah. Thank you. So any questions, comments, um, please, we would love to, to, to have you uh, participate and, and share. Dylan, please, please. Yeah, um, I just like to amend you. I am from rural Colorado, representative of the Yumaun Ute tribe, or a member of the Yumaun Ute tribe, per se. Um, and I always love to see other people's resiliency in their work and making the educational in, uh, system more, more welcoming to fellow Coloradoans. And definitely, thank you for you guys' time and thank you guys for your efforts. Unfortunately, I never was known about the situation until participating with this webinar. And definitely gonna share the information when it's more public of the Facebook campaign that you guys have and looking forward to inviting you guys to the campus of Fort Lewis College. Thank you, dear brother. Thank you, we appreciate that. And, and we, are, we think we are so proud of the fact that this would be a true human rights amendment that no person would be left outside. No one is excluded, all are included. Thank you. You know, appreciate that. Other comments, questions, thoughts? And Maria's taken my class before and knows that I am inextricably comfortable with silence. <laughs> You'll wait, huh? <laughs> I will wait and, you know, give people time to process. Um, to marinate, if you will. Well, colegas, thank you so much again for, for sharing this amazing work. I want, um, I'm gonna pass it back to, to Dr. Brittany Lane. Uh, who organized this amazing convening this week um, and who is committed um, you know, to supporting not only your work, 
um, but the work of teacher preparation and, and connecting and being in symbiosis across all levels of our education system. So I'm gonna pass it over back to you, uh, Dr. Lane, um, to kind of close us out and just wanna thank you all again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Montoya, um, and thank you, Dr. Espinoza. Uh, Maria, I, we have learned so much this week um, from our ed prep faculty and as we talk about diversifying the educator workforce um, and how um, intrinsically connected it is um, to ensuring that we have culturally responsive pedagogy and how that might even be necessary to come first before we can talk about recruitment or, or retention or preparation, how important it is. And I can't think of a more beautiful way to end the week um, and put an exclamation point on all that work um, by talking about the, you know, the fundamental right um, of, ed of education and educational dignity. So thank you so much for your time, your attention, your expertise, all of you. And thank you all to our participants um, it has been such a joy to uh, learn with you this week. All right. Take care, y'all. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.